Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, all of you to uh, what promises to be an enormously timely and exciting uh, session of our Global Leaders Forum. Uh, this session is on uh, growing green in a crowded, carbon-constrained world. And we're very fortunate to have some very distinguished panelists today. My name is David Girard. I'm professor here and director of the Energy Resources and Environment Program. Uh, we have uh, uh, Akim Steiner, who is the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program. We have uh, Kate Gordon, who is vice president for energy policy at the Center for American Progress. And we have Rashenda Van Leeuwen, who is the senior director of energy access at the UN Foundation. And I want to thank uh, uh, Tim Worth and all of the UN Foundation staff for working cooperatively with us to make this uh, such an extraordinary event. Uh, Akim, you have a, an overflow crowd uh, today. O opened up the reception room. Uh, but uh, uh, what uh, Akim is going to discuss in, the, in his keynote speech is something extremely critical uh, for the world because he is going to, to discuss how uh, their new report on green growth and a green economy and green development can address problems of uh, mitigation of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, also uh, poverty eradication and economic growth in those parts of the world which are extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And so he will, he will discuss how their ideas can address some of the major global challenges of capital mobilization, of climate adaptation and mitigation, of poverty reduction, and we look forward, Akim, very much to hearing your views on this. Uh, Akim, as you know, was re-elected as Executive Director of UNEP for another four-year term. He was elected in 2010. Uh, in 2009, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon also appointed him as Director General of the UN office in Nairobi. And of course, uh, uh, I've known Akim in many different uh, phases of his distinguished career, and it's delightful to see you again. Before joining UNEP, he was Director General of the World Conservation Union, the IUCN, uh, and he was Secretary General of the World Commission on Dams, and he has included, uh, he's had assignments with a wide variety of governmental, non-governmental, and international agencies in different parts of the world, and uh, he also, by the way, serves uh, on the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development, and Akim has had a very uh, international education at Oxford, London, the German Development Institute in Berlin, and the Harvard Business School. So he truly is a cosmopolitan international figure and is deeply knowledgeable about all of these issues. Akim, we're very privileged to have you here. Thank you, David, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is quite um, exciting to see a room so full and to also be together with my fellow panelists this afternoon uh, addressing a topic that is not new, but many things around that topic are new. And I would like to focus a little bit on what I believe are some of the reasons why when we talk today about a transition towards a green economy, we are moving from the visioning and aspirational and uh, some would say dreaming stage to the prospects, the very real prospects of having a transition towards a green economy becoming a central driving force of something that we began to agree as an international community, as a world community in 1992 when the world came together in Rio, agreed on the sustainable development paradigm, the Rio principles, Agenda 21, but as we are preparing to meet again 20 years later in the year 2012 in Rio, the Rio 20 conference, quite clearly the world is in a state of um, ambivalence in terms of whether sustainable development has carried us forward, whether the key indicators with which we look at the state of the world today are such that we can say, well, we've made a lot of progress even though we have not gone as far as we want to, or whether in fact the world is still going in the wrong direction. And I think it is always important to recognize that when you set yourself a target and you do not reach it, it doesn't mean that all you did and achieved in moving towards that target 
becomes irrelevant. It doesn't. And clearly we have come a long way from where we were when the world in 1980, in the 1980s, looked at the future and projected where the world would be if it did not do anything. And in some respects, I think we have seen in terms of environmental sustainability, in terms of equity, in terms of um, economic prospects for many of the poorest people across the world, some significant areas of progress. But the bottom line, the balance sheet, is unfortunately, if you take the Brundtland report as a kind of yardstick, really not very far from where that group of people projected we would be if we didn't do something about sustainability and development. And I will not go into the numerical and statistical description of that. Many of you will be familiar with it, but you do not have to look very far to find the kinds of reminders that on current trajectories, our countries, our global economy is still largely engaged in an extractive mode of sustaining economic growth, that it is mining the very resources that we need to feed 9 billion people in the future, be it land, be it water resources, be it the fisheries in the oceans. It is threatening fundamental life support systems through climate change and the emissions gap that remains after Copenhagen and Cancun to even come close to meeting the 2% global warming target that the IPCC set out. And we also are faced with, as you know, the prospects of reaching ecological tipping points that are very difficult to envisage just in terms of their ramifications and consequences. Whether it is permafrost, the release of methane, whether it is the melting of the Arctic, whether it is the loss of major uh, tropical forest resources around the world due to climate change, whether it is the destruction of coral reefs that still are of major concern, or as some of you may have noticed today, some of the smaller but nevertheless very vital developments such as the impacts that we seem to be having on, for example, pollinators and the bees in particular. We have just released a report this morning that points to a whole series, a cocktail, if you want, of um, factors that seem to be responsible for this phenomenon that we're observing in more and more places around the world of massive collapse of bee stocks and pollinating functions that are associated with them. The imperative to act in environmental terms is one that we have tried in this particular report that, uh, you know, I hope all of you will get a chance to take here. If not, on UNEP.org, you will find this report. What we have tried to do with the transition towards a green economy is to recast the environmental imperative to act in terms of social and economic outcomes. Now, some of you might say, well, that's great. We are all working on that agenda. True, but if you look at how the environmental community over the years has tried to engage society, it has very often done a cursory service in terms of addressing where people begin from, which is, do I have enough to eat tomorrow? It may not be the preoccupation of every American. It certainly is the preoccupation of hundreds of millions of people living in marginal lands in developing nations. Will I have a job tomorrow? Will I lose my savings? Where is my country going to go in terms of the great indicator of GDP growth? And I think it is in some ways critically important that we, one, accept that environmental imperatives to act have to be also cognizant and answerable to these social and economic objectives. And I think we have over the years developed that discourse and it is now maturing to a point where two things are beginning to happen. One is the environmental imperative to act is becoming economically literate. And I believe that is extremely important. Because time and again, we have drawn the attention of society to issues from basic toxins that go into human bodies. The phenomena that the two richest societies in the world, America and Japan, have some of the highest toxic substance levels in young children that they have ever had in their history. Um, where we point to things such as climate change and the potential disruption. And you may recall that it was really with Nick Stern's, Lord Stern's report, that the world began to translate that threat that may affect the next generation or three generations in the future into 
a contemporary set of choices. And for that reason, we in the United Nations Environment Program have invested a great deal of effort and time in assembling a community of professionals, analysts, <laughs> practitioners to try and capture this particular moment in time by articulating a green economy perspective that allows, first of all, a whole range of countries and actors to locate themselves either within such a trajectory or to deliberately put themselves outside that trajectory. And that's very important because I think it is increasingly difficult in our societies today to say, well, I'm against a green economy. Why would you be? Why would you want your children? Why would you want your health to be more threatened? Why would you want less energy security rather than more? Why would you not want to have more efficiency in your economy in terms of resource use? Why would you not want to reduce the risk to your supply chains in terms of global resource markets? Why would you not want to have less price volatility? And clearly, if you are going to argue against those issues, then yes, you would be against the transition towards a green economy. I think the reaction, however, that you also experience in this particular political moment here in the United States is more around ideology, and I think we can bring many of these arguments back to linking science to social and economic realities, and that is where people begin to engage, and not to allow people to drag things that have to be done now and have to be done collectively, not just in one country but by a global community, into the arena of the feasible. The other important part is that when we look at not just the economic literacy of the environmental reasons to act and the opportunities to act, we are also trying to address the fact that very often in the past you could put these facts on the table, but you were immediately, whether in a talk show, on the podium, or in, in a political uh, forum, put in the corner of, well, it's all very well, but we need jobs. We need economic growth, and you can't deliver on that. This report is, in a sense, a synthesis, first of all, of a work that we did with many, many colleagues and partners that looked at 10 sectors worldwide, from energy, transport, agriculture, tourism, etc., urban development, and simply collected best practices on a scalable, not just in terms of little pilot schemes and laboratory schemes, but on a scalable level of how you could catalyze transitions towards a green economy. And lo and behold, the world is full of them. And I think one of the key lessons that we draw out of this report is that a transition towards a green economy is not only possible, in fact, it is in some ways already underway. In stops and starts, sometimes in a very unsystematic way, which imposes on it much greater costs than there would have to be, and also not in a way that allows countries and also the public sector and the private sector to be mutually supportive. At the heart of this report lies a vision that we can, with just 2% of global GDP, catalyze structural transformation in our global economy, and, in fact, create more jobs than we would under a business-as-usual scenario, deliver more resource efficiency, and also assure economic growth even in the narrow neoclassical definition of GDP growth, which in fact we also spend quite a bit of time in perhaps finalizing the ultimate argument of why perhaps in Rio in 2012 the world should finally either discard of GDP as a singular indicator or find a way of locating the GDP indicator as the single most important indices for economic well-being in our economies through the kinds of work that Joe Stiglitz, Amartya Sen and others have done on GDP. It also points to two fundamental um, trajectories for economies. One is clearly the more resource efficient, less polluting technology trajectory. And when you just look at what is happening in the world today, it speaks for itself. Renewable energy resources in the year 2009 and 2010, investments in these resources, in these sectors, already exceeded the combined total of oil, gas, and coal combined. Who would have thought that just a few years ago? The other interesting thing is that it is not anymore the traditional Western uh, or Northern economies of North America and Europe and Japan who are dominant players in it. No, the Investments of China, India, and Brazil alone in the year 2010 exceeded those of the rest of the industrialized world put together, or North America, Europe. So here you have 
uh, a significant number of trends emerging that point to how quickly these transitions can happen when public policy is put in place, when the market is therefore able to deploy its full multiplier and scaling up function, remarkable things can happen. And again, the evidence, the empirical evidence that we can deploy today is fascinating because it is the, precisely those countries that took the boldest steps during the financial crisis in terms of the Green New Deal fiscal stimulus packages that uh, UNEP at the time called for with many others that when we are going to deploy $3,000 billion or more in stabilizing a financial crisis, then at least a significant share of that should be invested in tomorrow's economy and not simply in stabilizing yesterday's technology solutions. Now, some countries took this up, others didn't. The interesting thing is we today are looking, and this requires some more research, at a number of countries who did go very far. Interesting enough, China and Korea remain the greatest um, movers in that direction. China with the largest stimulus package that looked at uh, the broader green economy sectors for its fiscal stimulus. Korea, which put the highest proportion of a fiscal stimulus into it. But you can then go further. You can look towards an economy like Germany, which um, during the financial crisis was beginning to benefit from restructuring of some of its economic sectors before the crisis, but was also a country in which a major debate raged at the time when the feed-in tariffs were introduced and the renewable energy industry was jump-started. Today, Germany's economy is still the second or third largest exporting nation in the world, very sensitive to competitiveness on the global market. It's close to 18% of its total electricity being generated by renewables and has set itself on a path to achieve 80% renewable energy uh, supplies by 2050. And there are other countries in Europe that have even legislated 40%, 50% already. You can look towards a country like Mexico, which under the leadership of President Calderon has been pioneering a number of green economy initiatives across a variety of sectors, whether from household goods, energy efficiency, to um, building loans and building societies to encourage greener building. And lo and behold, again, a country that was in crisis is in fact growing at over 5% per annum at the moment. So the argument, at least in the counterfactual sense, that if you do move on these issues, you threaten growth, employment, and prosperity, is highly questionable, particularly in these sensitive economic times. The final point I want to highlight is that the green economy um, approach that UNEP is articulating in its work is also highlighting another fundamental issue that has been largely ignored by economics and macroeconomists for too long, and that is the notion of natural capital. Some of you may have followed the work that um, we did over the last few years in a global partnership with many institutions, amongst them IUCN, on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, led by Paman Sukdev. And at its simplest, what we try to do here is not to reduce the value of biodiversity and ecosystems down to a monetary value, but rather to expand the rationale for understanding the importance of conservation of sustainable management uh, and restoration of ecosystems by looking at the economic value or the opportunity cost of losing those services. And the interesting thing is that, as you all know, in our economy, the notion of something being invaluable is, if you want to be a little bit cynical, in the economic balance sheet means it has no value. And that is why also the economics or the lens of economics being applied to this notion of natural capital in our societies is so critical. And I end, although I know my colleagues will also speak to this, by just saying this is also immensely powerful because for many developing nations, natural capital is in fact their safety net. It is their foundation upon which to develop. The tragedy of today is that much of the world economy is still taking advantage of least developed and less developed economies by using them in a more updated model of an extractive global economy. We are literally buying up the resources that could in future sustain the development of many of the two to three billion people living in developing economies today and least developed countries. We are extracting them for the purpose of a global economy at a price that does not allow these countries to invest in sustainable management, but in fact in drawing down their natural capital. And even for those who want to put poverty eradication and the issues of equity at the center, the green economy does offer some very remarkable facts. 
In India, the contribution of forests to its GDP at a national level is estimated around 3, 4, 5 percent. If you take the value of forest ecosystems in relation to the livelihoods of the poorest, namely the 400 million in India, then you suddenly find that forest ecosystems are responsible for 80 to 90 percent of their GDP, the GDP of the poor. So anybody who goes out today and continues to advocate that the erosion and destruction of natural resources is a foundation for development and progress is in fact misleading the world. Because what we're really doing is we're not only impoverishing nations, we're also threatening the very life support systems on which the poorest depend until an economy can offer them better opportunities. I end with these few highlights. I hope um, you will find this an empowering and encouraging report because the time has come to not only present the world with problems and challenges and hard statistics, I think the time has come where those who understand environmental and sustainable development are in fact, to use the words somebody just gave me, the architects of our future economic policy. Here in Lyle, many of the answers that others have not been able to give and who have led us once again into jobless recoveries, old technologies and more of the same. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim, for that um, inspiring and operational vision of how such a transition is already occurring and can be accelerated and taken uh, to a global scale. And thank you for your remarks on how we are eroding our natural capital and our natural trust fund and how uh, smart technology and smart governance can reverse that. Um, and and you, you, you leave us hungry for more. So hopefully um, in the course of uh, the question and answer session you'll have a chance to interact with Akim and the other speakers on some of the points you've heard. I'd now like to introduce uh, Kate uh, Gordon. Uh, Kate is the Vice President for Energy Policy at the Center for American Progress in Washington. Uh, she, most recently, she was the co-director of the National Apollo Alliance, and she knows a great deal about um, the intersection of clean energy and economic development policy and has spent a career on, this, uh, on these issues, economic justice uh, and labor issues. Um, Kate is a, uh, has uh, law degrees and master's degrees from um, the University of California at Berkeley, but I'm sure Slice will not hold that against you. <laughs> um, so, Kate, you're up next. for what is a, a very, very useful report. It's um, particularly useful for those of us who've been working on clean energy issues here in the United States, uh, really from sort of a green jobs perspective. And I come from that movement and that world and particularly like about this report that it does something that we've been trying to do for a long time, which is move the conversation beyond one about specific numbers of jobs created in specific in industries to a conversation about an economic transformation. Looking at uh, prior economic transformations, especially in the industrialized era, what you really see, I mean, there's obvious examples, the Industrial Revolution, the high-tech revolution. What you really see is moves from less productive, more volatile, uh, less sustainable industries and occupations into something more productive, more efficient, less volatile, more diversified. That's exactly what we're talking about here. We're not talking about sort of one niche set of industries that uh, might create a few jobs here or a few jobs here and let's count the jobs in wind and solar and geothermal. We're really talking, as Akeem said, and the report really sells eloquently, about a transformation in the way we think about how we use resources, how we generate energy, how we use energy, how the world grows into the future. And I think that's critically important to understand. You know, I just want to say a couple things and throw some ideas out um, so we live a lot of time for discussion. The, the, the report talks about it, and I think it's, it's important to underscore the opportunities here for the economy and some of the opportunities that are really tangible opportunities. In renewable energy and energy efficiency and waste and recycling industries, there are tremendous opportunities across a range of occupations and industries. This is sort of a different scenario than a lot of uh, other sets of industries that we've invested in in the past. The financial sector is a great example. Um, here in the in sort of green sectors and green industries, we actually 
actually have opportunities across the innovation cycle. We have opportunities in research and development, in commercialization, in production and manufacturing, in operations and maintenance. These are opportunities that are particularly valuable because they, they, they present the ability for people with differing levels of skill to be really engaged in the green economy. There are low skill occupations, there are middle skill jobs, and I always try to remind people, and especially American audiences who never know this, that 60% of our workforce in the United States lacks a four-year college degree. 60% of our workforce is middle skilled, meaning high school degree, no four-year college degree, usually associates or some other um, technical degree. So we need to be creating jobs for the, this sector. It also um, offers many opportunities, of course, for high skill labor in the research, development, innovation side particularly. Uh, there's opportunities for new markets, and you heard a bit about this, but not just U.S. markets, emerging markets around the world are really looking at low-carbon solutions in part out of necessity, frankly. Huge opportunities, something between three and six trillion dollars of opportunity in the next ten years in world markets, and obviously, of course, there's an environmental imperative to move forward in this direction. Just wanted to say a couple words about, now there's the rosy picture of opportunity, a couple words about the challenges here in the United States that we face to a green economic vision. And I think you know some of them, but they're worth underscoring. First, we do face a challenge in terms of global competition. The United States is in fact behind in the, um, I, you know, I don't know if you want to call it a race or you know, sort of a collaborative you know, uh, uh, movement, but we are behind in developing and producing the technologies that will be the answer. Um, to, uh, to a low carbon future. We're behind for a lot of different political reasons. Um, part of why we're behind, honestly, is that we put all of our eggs into the financial sector for a while. Part of why we're behind is that we tend to focus on early stage research and development in this country to the exclusion of focusing on commercialization and production. Part of why we're behind is the decimation of our manufacturing sector. There's a lot of different reasons, but we are behind at this moment as we sit here. The second big challenge is that we are at risk of getting even further behind in the next two years. We have extraordinary partisan gridlock on these issues right now in Congress. Congressman Henry Waxman, who was recently the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, spoke at my institution on Monday and said in 30 years in Congress he has never seen this level of denial of science, of denial of fact, and of partisan uh, gridlock on some of these issues. He's never seen energy at such a partisan level of controversy, and I think that's really important. It's a very ideological time, not just on global warming, but there's an ideological opposition to the idea of a green economy in the current Congress, and that's a real challenge. And then finally, um, and, and Ahim didn't bring this up, but I think it's worth talking about, we have a challenge in the very growth of some of the economies that are actually doing well on this. Uh, on, on this, uh, this stuff, we, China has done enormous investment, has really put in place, I would say the building blocks of innovation here, has really put in place some of the you know, R&D and production and advanced manufacturing systems to become a leader here. On the other hand, China is growing enormously quickly, as is India, as is Brazil. These economies are still relying to a great extent on extractive industries. That will have an impact across the world, and one just quick thing I'll say is that it's having an impact here already. We, we need, as you heard, to move beyond an extractive economy. However, we're looking very seriously at uh, developing an enormous new sector in coal mining for coal export to China right now. So this is, the United States may be ramping down our use of coal, but we are developing the networks to get it to China. And that's an enormous new sort of opportunity for extractive industries and an enormous new challenge for moving beyond them. So with those quick thoughts, I will uh, turn it over. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and our third panelist is Rishenda Van Leeuwen. And Rishenda has, uh, again, over two decades of experience working on a range of global development issues in, in, private, uh, in the private sector and in the public sector, in emerging markets. And currently at the UN Foundation, uh, Rishenda is focused on practical and operational ways of scaling up solutions to provide uh, green energy, renewable energy for poverty reduction and vig vigorous, vibrant economic growth and looking at practical ways 
of finding those solutions and scaling them up and scaling them up rapidly. So, uh, Rishenda, um, you're next. Um, thank you very much, David, and, and thanks, Akim, for a great presentation. I think this report really contains um, some tremendous nuggets of, of information that are relevant to the work that I'm doing. Um, I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, price and production subsidies for fossil fuels collectively exceeded 650 billion U.S. dollars in 2008. That's one statistic. The second statistic, ensuring access to electricity for all requires $36 billion per year between 2010 and 2030. That's $720 billion, um, according to estimates by the IEA. So just uh, an annual subsidy versus what it requires to take to help the quarter of the world that still does not have any access to electricity. Um, so I just want to, to throw that out to, to the audience to think about. Uh, what I work really on is, is on the issue of so, social equity, um, particularly for the very poorest people. As I mentioned, we have 1.6 billion people lacking access to electricity. Another 1 billion people have um, intermittent grid access. Another 2.5 to 3 billion people are using traditional biomass to meet their cooking needs. Now, what does that mean at the level of the household? It means, first of all, um, on the cooking side, that uh, um, women and children are exposed to very high levels of indoor air pollution that kills prematurely about 2 million women and children per year. That's more than die of malaria on an annual basis. At the same time, the lack of electricity um, you know, for those of you who live in Maryland like I do, we complain about Pepco when the power goes out. We've been really sort of saying it's like a developing country. Well, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but uh, what, what does it really mean? Um, to bring it, the lever of the green economy down to the very poor, I was, just to give an example, I was in uh, Kakabila, which is an indigenous mosquito community off the east coast of Nicaragua, um, about 18 months, almost two years ago, visiting a village that for the first time had a small wind turbine. And what was that doing? That was providing lighting for the school um, so that in the evenings women could take literacy classes so they could actually become more educated. It was charging the cell phones. People already had cell phones. But the problem was that until they had the wind turbine there, they actually had to take a boat 45 minutes across the lagoon to the next village over where they actually had some electricity before they could charge them. Those cell phones not only provide access to market for some of the goods that they provide so they can get better in indications on pricing, they also provide a connection when women are in, in labor and they have medical issues of helping to get access to hospitals. At the same time, they had a second wind turbine that they put up on the medical clinic. Now, not only did that provide refrigeration for some of the medications that were required in the village to help refrigerate them, but it was also an incentive for them to be able to actually have a doctor who lived in the village. Why? Because the doctor coming out from a town was used to having electricity, and nobody was going to stay there and live there, and the same with the teachers, without that access to electricity. So providing that not only provided um, increased opportunities in terms of livelihood, and there are many, many ways that providing that access can uh, help with increasing livelihoods, whether it's for small farmers who can use solar-powered drip irrigation um, to help with, uh, with uh, watering their crops, whether it's the lighting in the home that a lot of people tend to dismiss and say, well, that's just for consumption purposes, it's not really productive. Well, it's productive if you can actually run your home-based business for a couple of extra hours in the evening. It's productive if your children are able to actually see to do their homework in the evening and can do better in school. It may not be productive in today's dollars, but your children down the road are getting a better education. Now, one of the other myths about the poor is, uh, is that, of course, um, these kinds of technologies are too expensive for the very poor. You know, we say solar is expensive for the rich, renewable exp energies are expensive for the rich. Actually, very often they're the most affordable um, type of energy that's available to the poor. Another important statistic from the report, 110 million households in Africa at the lowest income level spend more than 4 billion US dollars per year on kerosene-based lighting, which is costly, inefficient, unsafe, and unhealthy. Now, the really good news there is that for what you're paying for kerosene-based lighting, which is often four, five, ten U.S. dollars per month for a household, these days we have solutions that are available, small scale, sure, 
Um, but photovoltaic solutions and others that are coming onto the market with LED technologies that did not exist 10 years ago, with better battery solutions, and because of they're more efficient as well, they require smaller amounts of solar panels to help charge them, that actually cost the same or less than what the, uh, what the households are already paying for a kerosene-based lighting solution. Now, why is that important? First of all, it's very difficult in terms of the price point for the poor sometimes to pay upfront $200 or $300 for a solar home system, which is what used to be the, the only available system to them. At the same time now, though, there are opportunities through microfinancing, through new financing mechanisms, through carbon financing, to help support the very poor to be able to access some of these solutions. I'm not advocating that we should be doing everything off-grid for the very poor. Certainly, we should be continuing with grid extension. We should be continuing to look at microgrid opportunities as well. But the interesting thing about pushing a green economy and supporting a green economy is that it's already happening. And as, as others have already said, the, the challenge is really to help scale it up more quickly. Using the market, there are very, very um, uh, good solutions now that are unsubsidized. And in fact, a couple of years ago, I know Kenya had the largest unsubsidized solar uh, photovoltaic market in the world. Kenya, um, not Germany. Um, and so I think the opportunity that presents itself for us is really to see not only in a very narrow definition of what's it providing in terms of today's jobs or what's it providing in terms of reduction of fossil fuels today, but also looking at the much broader paradigm of what's it providing in terms of access to better health, better education, better livelihoods, which may help to make the poor uh, less vulnerable. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. The speakers have obviously shown how productive and efficient they are in keeping to their allotted time. Um, before I open it up to the whole audience, I just wanted to throw out a, a couple of uh, questions uh, for Akim and um, Rashenda uh, and Kate. One is clearly the magnitude of the investments required are extraordinarily modest. The report says 2% of GDP. The International Energy Agency says that for 3% of of what is going into the capital investment in, in infrastructure, in energy and power, we could have universal access to electricity services. So it's not really a capital mobilization issue. It's clearly an issue that involves uh, uh, incentives for governments and incentives for uh, leaders uh, in the private sector as well. And so I, I basically had a couple of questions for the, the audience. One is, what progress can we expect the international community to make up, you know, before Rio and then at Rio, what would some green economic outcomes look like at Rio, which will be attended by global leaders? And uh, what is the single most important thing governments can do now in the lead up to Rio to, to put their own nations uh, and, and the global community on this trajectory, which uh, uh, has been described by, so eloquently by the speakers? Okay. Thank you. I think, David, one of the encouraging things isn't if you uh, follow at all the discussions leading up to this conference in Rio in 2012, you can at the moment take two standpoints. You can say, well, another date, another conference, and there is not even a, a clear set of outcomes on the table. Well, that's one option, but I personally would go for the other option, which is to say, there is an immense demand out there for better answers at this moment in time, particularly aimed also at the international system, if I may put it that way. Because these green economy examples we cite, we draw from virtually all countries on the planet. This is no longer something that is theoretical. Countries are, out of necessity, out of visionary leadership, moving in this direction, but what they are confronted with is essentially a very traditional financial, treasury, and economic policy world that still has an, a reluctance to believe that these transitions are possible. And secondly, an international system, including the aid system, including the international financial institutions, including the export credit guarantee agencies that are not accelerating their support to countries, but are in fact leaving countries with an empty promise. And this is very frustrating because if you take a country like Kenya, you refer to it just now in terms of solar market, 
Kenya today is a country that is transforming its energy economy literally overnight. It passed the legislation on green energy. It will add more than double of the existing capacity just in the next three years with geothermal and wind power. And it nearly couldn't do that because it couldn't find some international financing and risk credit guarantee in order to attract private investor capital. And this is the reality that, that we face today. So, Look to Rio as an opportunity, and I would also say for the United States in particular. You can either let this thing in Rio sort of you know, meander along, and I can assure you there is no summit that is called that does not turn into a summit. I mean, this is in the nature of these events. And we also have a very proud and a very visionary country hosting this conference. And the question I think that now arises is, do countries engage and shape that agenda? Because that summit, in a sense, is like a table that has been set up, but the menu is still to be developed. And also not with three years of negotiating brackets and commerce, but literally 12 months. So I think the takeaway from Rio will be that the green economy becomes an accepted international platform for cooperation, and that, we've, that we address the two key factors in terms of retooling, not how a country like Chile or Kenya, Uganda, India, China, run their national development. I don't think we should negotiate people's sovereign choices, and you know this better than anyone in this country here. But what we should do is to retool the international system that for those countries who want to move, there is an international community willing and ready to help rather than putting obstacles in place. And that goes to the fundamental issue of financing and technology, and not in the traditional domains of, you know, can you give me some money so I can save myself, but rather let's enter into partnerships. The wind power farm I mentioned in Kenya will be the largest wind power farm on the African continent. It's a public and private partnership. It overnight adds two, 350 megawatts to a grid that so far has 1,300 megawatts 50 years and plus after independence. So you can see the energy revolution that we could together unleash. And the tragedy of, of you know, a lot of this climate debate and climate financing is an extraordinary missed opportunity. While people here in the Congress or in the Bundestag or in the House of Lords in the UK discuss you know, investing money in developing countries, let me simply leave you with one test of why Rio could be extremely important. Africa is also a continent with one billion people now. 85% don't have access to electricity, and I can assure you the next 30 years will be uh, in a sense, the decades of the African continent to expand its energy infrastructure, its mobility infrastructure. Now, does the world want Africa to add all of the 20th century weight of carbon emissions and resource consumption to the global equation yet again? Or do we help this continent to actually delink its future economic growth from the kind of pollution and resource uh, wasteful economy that we, in a sense, have seen drive development all over the world? The answer, I think, is very simple. You can't afford not to. But look at how the world treats Africa at the moment as a social welfare case, as a kind of place where you know, we put peacekeeping and we try and keep things sort of from getting out of hand and from having too many refugees. This is a billion people continent on the verge of its economic transformation. And that is why these international summits can matter, including on this issue. Thank you for that. Sorry. Thank you for that um, powerful and compelling answer. Just uh, wondered if any of the other panelists had remarks on this, and then we'll open it up. I think um, Rio Plus 20 is a very interesting opportunity um, to talk about some of these issues outside the, the normal uh, climate negotiation process. It's uh, very unclear what will happen in South Africa in the climate negotiations this year, if anything. Um, I think the, the consensus is a binding agreement is not possible. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where we can get, but Rio Plus 20 and other, and then major economies forum and other fora offer an interesting opportunity to have some of these conversations about economic cooperation, about global financing, um, some of the issues we've talked about. Again, I think that the U.S. role will be very interesting and, and complicated. Um, you know, I said, and you all know, that Congress is having a hard time right now with the, the uh, just the facts of global warming. I think two-thirds uh, of the new members of the House are, in fact, climate deniers in that they don't believe global warming exists. So that's, that's a pretty stark reality. 
But um, they're also very much in a budget conversation that makes international aid really difficult. It's a, a time where, you know, those of you who kind of dig into this stuff and looked at, for instance, the House Republican budget cut uh, proposal saw that almost every international aid program was bottomed out, including all the climate programs and the um, green economy programs. That's going to be a problem <laughs> in any of these international discussions. I would encourage, and I think there is progress to be made at the subnational level. I think it's interesting to look at some of the regional climate negotiations going on in the United States, the Western Climate Initiative among the Western states and four Canadian provinces, and uh, the REGI Initiative, which is the Northwest, the Northeast Initiative, which I know is weakened by New Hampshire potentially leaving it, but may be strengthened by a couple of Midwest states joining it. Um, those are interesting places to look for potential partners in international agreements. Uh, whether you can do an international negotiation with a subnational uh, climate uh, trading arm is an interesting question, but it might be an interesting way to put some pressure on our national government to move forward in this direction. The other thing I would say is I think it's not it's not a bad idea in the sort of geopolitics of climate and energy right now for the nations that really are leading in this space to put external pressure on the United States by making um, side agreements with each other on uh, green economy areas, on technology transfer, on financing. That's the kind of thing that may actually move this Congress toward thinking about this as sort of a global competitiveness imperative to move into more of a green economy space. So I think I, I would say I think maybe the best opportunity to move the United States in current negotiations and in the summits is both from pressure from the bottom and pressure from the top. And it's something to think about, or pressure from outside and pressure from the bottom. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Rishanda, did you have any thoughts? I think Akeem said it extremely well, so I'll, I'll uh, just echo what he was saying. Great. Um, well, let's open it up. We have uh, probably about a half hour of conversation. Um, and please identify yourself and your institution when you ask the question, just so we know the audience. Um, so we have a hand up at the back, right behind you, actually, Andrea. Thank you for your interesting remarks. I'm Robert Thomas in Global Resources News. Uh, you speak of a 2% of GDP investment uh, funding level. Um, and I'm just wondering, can you speak to the sources of that funding through value-added taxes or payment for environmental services or whatever? Could, could you speak to that? And also, uh, you, you spoke of the uh, amount of funding that it takes to get electricity to all people. So if the panel could speak to uh, how these programs could be funded. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Akim, would you like to answer the 2% the number, and then maybe Vishenda and I could answer the, the IEA number? As with all these reports, it's a 2% a figure is a global figure that is an estimate. I think in, um, in the first instance, it is a figure that will depend in many respects on individual country context. In some parts of the world, you will have to look at a more significant public financing uh, element of it, but it is not just public finance on the contrary. We already know that quite a lot of this is simply about leveraging the marketplace. If you take the investment in the renewable energy sector in 2010, the numbers are close to 170, 180 billion, and we expect for 2009, pardon me, and for 2010, it may even be closer to 200 and plus billion. Bloomberg and, and UNEP and others, we, have, we produce the Sustainable Energy Finance Report, which will come out in April, May, when we have a solid basis on which to estimate this. So you can already see that through a mixture of public and private financing, just in the renewable energy sector, we're talking about you know a, a quarter of a a trillion being deployed within the next two to three years. But I think the report begins, first of all, by drawing attention to subsidies, because if you add the subsidies of $600 billion or so for fossil fuel, another two to $300 billion for agriculture, then sectors such as fisheries with $27 billion, again, uh, most of which are perverse subsidies, 
encouraging larger boats with cheaper fuel and larger nets to go out and catch the last fish, so to speak, um, out there, then you very quickly come to a point where, looked at globally, the subsidies and the perverse subsidies are already such that you only need to redeploy public finance, taxpayers' money, from leading us astray in terms of consumption and production to being more sustainable. But what the report shows, and I think this is the most important message, the days when you had you know, the Chicago School, the Washington Consensus, the less state, the better, the more market, the better, then, and which followed a kind of statist, etatist uh, era of the 60s and 70s, what is quite clear today is that the intelligent interaction between public policy on behalf of a society, in a sense, structuring the directions in which it would like its economy from a social, environmental, and economic point of view to go, and its interaction with the private sector, the capital markets, the individual consumers, holds, if you want, the secret on how to make this transition. The right public policy at the right moment can trigger a phenomenal development. And if you look at the photovoltaic um, revolution that is now underway, I think one really has to call it that way. Only about six, seven years ago, one of the leading funds predicted for the year 2010 that we would maybe add one megawatt of um, photovoltaic to the international grid. Well, last year, uh, um, gigawatt, sorry, and last year we have already surpassed 17.5. And the ability of the industry to respond to scale up and also to reduce costs is phenomenal. The pricing, I think, Kenny, you know much more about this, but roughly in the next last 12 to 50 months, the price for photovoltaic panels has come down by 50%. And the pundits expect the same thing to happen again in the next 12 to 15 months. Now, just imagine what that does to all these great cost-benefit calculations and the scenarios on how the world would have invested in energy if only it had been cheaper. Well, public policy, demand, economies of scale, China entering now as the largest manufacturer of photovoltaic panels in the world, um, has overnight changed the global marketplace. And this speaks to, I think, what Kate and, and we have been saying here on the panel, where is the United States with its high-tech R&D economy? Every tenth household in China now has solar thermal water heating. And wh where are we, the people who had this stuff and had the money to put it on our roofs 15, 20 years ago? These are, I think, the kind of financing dimensions that uh, point to the fact that this is not an insurmountable challenge. It is actually just a matter of rethinking the deployment of public resources and how best to leverage private investment. Thank you, uh, Hakim. Uh, Rushenda, did you want to add to that? Um, yes, just, just to say, I mean, on the, on the funding for the electricity for all, yes, it's, it's very much a combination of, of public and private financing. And one of the myths that's out there um, for the very poor, again, is, is, well, they're very dependent on aid, so everything has to be done through aid. And the good news on that is that actually there's a market there, there's always been a market there. It's just that the market has been using a 19th century technology, which is kerosene-based lighting. Um, we're now in the 21st century. Um, there's, because there's already a market there, there are opportunities for private sector companies, some of which actually in this case are American, um, to come in and provide technologies and services even for the very poorest of the poor. So if there's a market there, even for the very poorest of the poor to be able to use renewable energies to create their electrification, then one would think um, that perhaps for the rest of the world there are opportunities in that, in that regard as well. Thank you, uh, There's a question up here in front, and then... Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Walker. I work with uh, Global Green USA here in Washington, D.C., and... As many of you probably know, we're the U.S. national affiliate of Mikhail Gorbachev's Green Cross International in not far from you, Joachim, in Geneva. Um, I had a question for all of you on the sort of interconnection between global security issues, of which SIAS deals with a lot. I'm an alum of SIAS, by the way, uh, and the green economy and the green transition. You know, I think in particular, um, if we look at poverty and climate change, uh, and the green economy. Obviously, poverty, the issue of poverty that Rashinda talked about, I think it drives a lot of regional insecurity issues with immigration and migration. We see this in the Middle East today. I think, secondly, of the, simply the resource burden 
of militaries across the world, particularly here in the United States and certainly NATO and Western Europe, but also China, Russia, India, <clears throat> Japan. Uh, it seems to us in, in many ways is such an enormous burden. Our own discretionary budget in the United States is you know, 50 to 75 percent military spending today. I think thirdly of carbon emissions, uh, I think very few people recognize the fact that the U.S. military, for example, uh, ranks about 50th worldwide uh, compared with national economies in carbon emissions and global warming impact and use of fossil fuels. And then the fourth point I would just note, but there are many more uh, than this, is really uh, nuclear nonproliferation issues. And none of you have mentioned the role of nuclear power in the future as an alternative energy source. Uh, but I think this obviously is something we'll, we'll have to deal with uh, in many ways. We remain very concerned, and Gorbachev himself remains very concerned over the proliferation consequences and the environmental impact of high-level radioactive waste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to uh, comment on any aspect of that? Sure. I think it's a, it's a great point. And um, uh, just to follow up on your point about the U.S. military, the U.S. military clearly recognizes this issue. Um, the Quadrennial Defense Review talked about global warming as a threat to national security. The U.S. military has become a leader in the use uh, and development of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies, interestingly, not just in operations, but in installations as well. Uh, great examples are the, Afghan, the uh, Marines in Afghanistan using solar, using portable solar technology um, in the field so that they don't have to have power lines. Um, they can be much more mobile. And then in terms of installations, the U.S. military is doing a lot of work, very good work, on developing microgrids for the bases so that the bases have their own power supplies. And that's a national security imperative as well. I think that's incredibly encouraging, actually, both from the standpoint of uh, getting the military to be more independent, which is important, but also the military is a great spokesperson or spoke messenger on these issues to both sides of the aisle in Congress. And uh, the military also does a lot of spending on research development and production. So it's, it's a good sign and, and a place where we're really looking for the next couple of years. I would just also underscore your point about just volatility in general. I think the, the Middle East, um, what we've been seeing in Libya uh, lately, but also looking at Saudi Arabia, which is, you know, there's more and more articles out. You know, we just did one, but there's more and more out about Saudi Arabia just being much more unstable than people think. Um, there's leadership changes. The, pres the king is, is not well. Uh, lots of domestic spending to keep unrest down. It's a very concerning situation. You dig into that and you really realize, and many of you know this, I'm sure, how dependent we are on Saudi Arabia um, for our energy. Uh, we may not get most of our oil supply from Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia's importance in the world oil market as who we all turn to when there's any supply disruption is incredibly important and I think scary um, when we start to think about what happens if there is, in fact, unrest in Saudi Arabia and across the Middle East. So, uh, you know, we've been trying to make the point, really underscore the point about the inherent volatility of oil markets worldwide and the need to really move beyond this as our core technology over the long term. It's not a short-term thing, but over the long term, we need to get ourselves in the United States, but this is also an international imperative, less dependent on sort of these countries that, um, that, that do have uh, difficult and unstable regimes and less dependent on sort of the world oil markets in general. So those are two big points. I won't um, I talk about nuclear. The only thing I'll say about nuclear right now about the United States is it is just simply not um, economically viable to build a nuclear plant in the United States right now. So we can talk about it a lot from a political perspective, but unless there are significant increases in things like the loan guarantee program and national subsidies, we just don't have, it's not an economically viable thing. That does not mean that our nuclear industry is not doing an enormous amount of development for other countries, though, which they are. So it is an incredibly important point that you brought up. Thank you, Kate. Just um, take a few more questions. Just on the nuclear issue, and um, as my students know, we, we spent several <laughs> sessions discussing it in detail, so I won't, but I'll do a 30-second summary, which is that Kate's point about nuclear reactors in the United States, the next generation, the cheapest price that you can get from the industry right now is $4,000 a kilowatt installed. And if you do the numbers, you, you, you can't actually build them without significant subsidies uh, of the kind that already exist, uh, the 600 billion that 
you know, global subsidies, a fossil that Akeem referred to. We'll have to add to that. And, and is it going to be feasible in today's budget environment to have public uh, subsidies for, for such a technology? So, so, so that's, a, that's the Achilles heel uh, of, and, and the nuclear industry knows that well, which is why they're looking at markets, you know, in other countries. Um, so anyway, uh, take a few more questions there. There's a hand there in the back, right, right near you, Anne, just on the, thank you. <clears throat> Lord Friberg, Climate and Energy Attaché at the Swedish Embassy. Thank you, Achim, for your comments. It was very interesting to hear. I would like to ask, what role would you say that Rio plus 20, or Stockholm plus 40, that Swedes would like to call it, uh, uh, do you see that a reform of the global environmental governance can play in moving on a system level towards more the green economy, and then in particular, how do you see this process interacting with the UNFC, Triple C process on, on climate change? Right. That's um, <laughs> actually. I recently heard the uh, French ambassador in New York uh, inviting people to Paris minus ten. So that's the next one. <laughs> But thank you for bringing up Stockholm because, um, and uh, you know, we have somebody here who was, uh, you know, John McDonald, very much central to what happened in Stockholm. It occurred to me just a few days ago when we had our governing council that I was 11 years old when Stockholm happened. I will be 51 years old when Rio plus 20 happens. And it's a bit disconcerting that the intention, the mandate, the aspirations that articulated in 1972 the vision for a United Nations Environment Program as a global authority with all the kind of um, core elements of a mandate that were to help the world move forward on the issues of environment, sustainable development, are still somewhere in the corridors of discussion. And I think to some extent we, we are at a point where we have to recognize that if you want to give to use the Rio analogy the, the, with the three pillars, whether that will forever be our best analogy or not, one can debate about it. We have the economic, environmental, and social pillar. If you genuinely believe that the environmental pillar needs to be strengthened because we clearly have not been able to move the world fast enough on some of the sustainability issues, then you have to begin with the fact that you remain to this day with a, a governance platform that is in many respects very weak. 58 countries constitute the governing council. The other 140 or so have to come there and essentially participate in a discussion without a vote, if you were to have a vote. The second thing is the governing council can spend five days discussing issues. It has very little local standard because in order for things to really become accepted, they have to send it in an envelope to New York, whereas I often say somewhere between floods in Pakistan and earthquakes in Haiti and Iraq and Afghanistan, um, maybe we can also address this thing from the Governing Council of UNEP on environmental and so on. So it's a very weak form of providing um, governance by the ministers responsible for the environment of the world's nations, analogous, analogous to how a World Health Assembly brings together the countries. They make decisions as health ministers, and they essentially are decisions that nations have agreed to. The other part of it is that UNEP remains a very a limited institution in terms of what developing countries would like to see, which is much more direct support in their transition. And here I make the connection to the green economy. I believe it is perhaps no coincidence that for the Rio uh, meeting in 2012, the green economy and the institutional framework for sustainable development have been chosen as the two themes. Because if we are going to achieve the kinds of structural transformations we've talked about, you cannot do that with an architecture of institutions conceived of 20, 30, 40 years ago in a world that has fundamentally changed in terms of the players, the actors, the drivers, the scale of the problem and, and in a sense the, the speed by which we need to respond. So I do believe that Rio, if there is a political will, and here we come back to a very simple truth, either Rio 2012 becomes a political project where the White Houses and the number 10s and uh, the chancelleries of this world 
um, decide that they want to actually move this thing forward, then I think you could have a very important meeting uh, in line with Stockholm 72, in line with 92 in Rio, but only if there is a political project, notwithstanding some of the domestic uh, issues that are not unique to the United States, by the way. I mean, you can look to the Netherlands today, and you also have a very challenging political environment. But I often think elections usually don't have such major swings. I mean, America has been a polarized uh, public uh, population for many years in electoral terms. I mean, the 50% who believe you need to make progress and then haven't somehow left the country, right? I mean, there is still a debate to be had. And I hope that debate will, you know, include also leadership. Because the green economy, if you look around the world today, where is the green economy happening? It's actually because heads of state and government are some of the most important drivers of these transformations. Thank you, Akim. An impassioned plea for leadership and also streamlining archaic institutions uh, as part of this. Um, the, um, <laughs> there's another hand up there, and then I'll come to the front. Right here. Two, okay. Yeah, John Talberth, the World Resources Institute. Um, two questions, I guess. That's probably not fair. One is um, I think the, the Green Economy Report has a, a very good discussion of some general enabling conditions, kind of the regulatory framework, the expenditure policies, um, some of the taxes, tariffs, et cetera. Um, and this is going to David's uh, question before, which we really didn't get an answer to. If a country was really interested in going down uh, the green economy path sooner rather than later, can you name two to three, maybe even four, high priority policies that ought to be looked at uh, um, soon? Um, second is one of those strategies, one of those policy sets, perhaps related to reversing some of the uh, deleterious effects of our current trade system. Um, there's many who suggest that this kind of unfettered, globalized free trade regime we're in now um, has been uh, contributing to sustainable development problems, not uh, uh, benefiting them and uh, through environmental externalities, uh, volatility, et cetera. So is that something to look at? Okay. Um, Jump in. Jump in uh, quickly. I, I think that's a great question, and, and it goes to solutions, which is always a good thing to do. Um, you know, at least at the Center for American Progress, and we're not unique in this, but have sort of laid out three categories of policies that we think are imperative, and I'll talk about. I'll say what those are, and then I'll say sort of where I think we, at least in the United States, which is my area of expertise, what we could do in the short term. Um, the three categories are essentially policies that help to create a market for products so that, you know, either uh, put a price on carbon, which creates a market for low carbon technology, or renewable energy standards, feed and tariffs, that category of uh, building codes, that category of policy. Um, uh, driving, because creating markets does in fact drive private industry to do more investment in order to meet a market demand. Uh, you see that with solar water heaters in China, as we just heard about. Um, second set of policies are really financing policies, not necessarily direct financing, but helping to move money into markets. So loan guarantees, accelerated depreciation, uh, revolving loans, there's a tax credits, there's a huge number of policies in that category. And third is really direct infrastructure investments, getting the thing itself to market um, through whether that's transportation or the grid or smart grid um, or other infrastructure investments. I think those are all important, and uh, many countries need to do po things in each of those categories, and internationally we clearly have a lot of work to do on the financing piece in particular. Um, in the United States, I, you know, I think, despite all my pessimism, I think that there is in fact some opportunity in that first category to help uh, spur some national markets for some of these technologies and for energy efficiency, which would be hugely useful in this country to start moving us toward more of an economic sort of imperative on, on the green economy. There are a couple ways to do that that are being discussed right now. Um, a renewable energy standard or a clean energy standard is one that would say, you know, X percent of the electricity from utilities needs to come from renewable or low carbon sources by Y date. That's uh, something I think actually has some interesting bipartisan support and um, could put an industry support and could potentially move in the next two years. Very controversial, but um, could potentially move. And uh, also a couple of areas around financing. Um, so discussions about uh, an infrastructure bank, discussions about a green bank. There are some interesting financing tools out there. But in the U.S., I would say, and this is just my perspective, that our critical need right now is that demand creation, 
because we're talking to industries um, across the country that did a lot of investment during the Recovery Act uh, era and a lot of investment in deployment, especially in renewables, who are now closing their doors or going to other countries. And the number one reason they cite for that is not the subsidies being offered by those countries, but the lack of demand, consistent demand in this country. Thank you, Kate. Um, Akim just had a, um, a few quick points to make. Just in a nutshell, because we don't have time, fiscal policy, absolutely central. We had a meeting this morning also with the managing director of the IMF, in which I have uh, raised with him the, the importance of an institution like IMF also to begin to deploy its economic expertise and its ability to speak to uh, the bastions of macroeconomic policy through the lens of fiscal policy instruments. So that's a major one. Second one is... Um, the standards and norms setting. I mean, that's how you help a market to transform itself. And I think it also, to some extent, um, speaks to the issue of the, the trade agenda. I'm not convinced that free trade in itself is the problem here. Uh, the question is whether we have global markets that allow free trade to be not of a kind of extractive and uh, destructive uh, resource driving base, which is probably in terms of some of the WTO regulations doable. If you had Pascal Lamy here, the head of the WTO, he would say to you, free trade is not the problem. The problem is a free trade regime that continues to emulate also the domestic phenomenon where natural resources are not valued, etc., etc. The third area I would point to is financing instruments. Simple example, replacing water heaters in houses was always very difficult. The consumer doesn't have the money to buy the solar thermal heating, the utility has no interest in it, and why would a bank lend to thousands of households? We took that challenge on and it was so simple to solve. We just brought the banks together and we've done this with hundreds of thousands of households in, in, dozen, in a dozen countries by now almost. You bring the bank together, meet with the utility, arrange a package finance deal, the utility pre-finances through the money from the bank, the replacement of your electric water heater, the consumer from day one pays a little bit less every month in the electricity bill until he or she has repaid the investment cost, at the end of which they save 30 to 40 percent of the electricity bill. The utility is happy. The bank has a 95 percent or 99 percent repayment rate. Why on earth didn't the market come up with this? And it's such a classic example on a small scale, but scalable to millions of households. And if you think electric water heating is, in many countries, a quarter to a third of your electricity consumption household level. Final example, um, the market instruments from which we can learn and the concept of value at risk, something that the financial markets have in a sense perfected is perhaps an exaggeration, but um, when they look at investments, they have a value at risk approach to looking at this. We need to take some of those instruments and make them more informed in terms of an ecological value at risk. If you were to have taken the BP platform incident and looked at choices that were made along the way and had put an ecological value at risk formula in there, you would never ever have allowed some of these things to not have been put in that were not put in and led to this disaster. And I think we will also deal with some of the extractive industries in the future simply from the point of view that if you factor in the ecological value at risk, you would not touch some of these things anymore. And that is, I think, uh, something we also have to learn. So it is not just about regulation. Uh, it is also about risk and risk management tools that we can learn a great deal from in, in terms of the marketplace. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Rishendra. Um, I just want to specifically mention on, on the emerging, emerging market side in terms of risk mitigation, um, I think one of the other areas, particularly for, for private sector investment, is, is exactly in, in the risk mitigation, particularly for the first transaction in a particular technology um, in a different, different emerging market environment. So that requires things like having a secure power purchase agreement policy in place so that you, you can um, reduce some of the risk for uh, investors coming in initially. It includes looking at things like um, import uh, duties and things like that, which can be completely non-aligned between sectors. So on the one hand, your energy ministry has a nice plan around energy access, but on the other hand, um, there's 100% duty on any kind of import of uh, solar products coming into the country. So it's, it's looking at those areas as well. Thank you, Realize that as we approach 2 o'clock, people have to peel off, but there's 
person in the back who's had his hand up for a long time, and then there's a group here in front, in fact, <laughs> who've had their hands up too. So after you, we'll go to the front. Sorry about the random uh, thank issue. Thank, thank you, you, David. I try to keep it short. Alexander Ox, World Watch Institute. Mm. First of all, congratulations to a very insightful report and for sharing uh, your, your ideas here. Uh, my question regards to how to move forward from here and, and where this all leaves us, and, and if not going from ideas to action to go to more action much more quickly uh, than what we've seen in the past. And, and I think in moving this forward, the two main issues that Rio 2012, to look forward and not backwards, Rio 2012, uh, will address this kind of a disconnect between the two. The, the one is the green economy. Um, it is where the problems hit and also where the solutions are found. And that's mostly a local thing, a state thing, maybe a na national thing, but it's not really that much a global thing. The second main issue is the institutional framework, and that's something that the UN has very much struggled with in, in recent years, to bring a global consensus on some of the key issues into place and find the support. And uh, Kate has mentioned the problems here in this country to find really the support for moving the climate and energy agenda forward and other areas as well. We find this everywhere. So th there's a disconnect sort of in the bottom up and the top down. It seems the UN moves if you look at the Copenhagen Agreement, more to a bottom-up uh, movement, at least for the next years, until we can be there where we do top-down again or find some sort of a global agreement. What are your thoughts on this? What, what can be the role, particularly of the UN, to support the bottom-up action so that this all, you know, at some point hopefully uh, ends up in, in, in some, some kind of a, a, a global agreement? I, I would um, agree with you that in many ways the green economy or the transitions and pathways are a lot to do with national and in some ways local uh, decisions. But I think there is a critical element both in terms of a global marketplace and also in terms of particularly for those countries who do not have the financial and technological means at their disposal for the international system to be engaged. So, Remember, there are more than 100 countries, members of the United Nations, who have less than 10 million people. It's an interesting thing I just learned because there's a forum of small states that has formed in the UN. And that's 100 votes in a General Assembly of 190, oops, I'm not sure now, but it's 93, isn't it? Yeah, I should know that. Um, well, there's new ones coming along all the time, right? And uh, I think what is, what is extremely interesting is that Many of these countries are, in a sense, inclined out of necessity to move very quickly towards a, a green economy kind of pathway, but do not have the means to do so. And so Rio is important from an international agenda perspective, and I think it does need to speak to the international financial institutions. It does need to speak to the international finance and capital world. What kind of risk guarantee instruments can um, the international community put in place to have more private sector engagement in these countries? How can technology transfer occur? Not in surrendering patent rights, but in allowing countries access to technology. And here the financing issue is extremely important. But yes, you're right. Um, the United Nations is struggling, but that is because nations are not united. And I, you know, the UN is not, I mean, it is a bureaucracy also in terms of an underpinning of the, the edifice of multilateralism. But I think it is very important to remember that the United Nations is you, and you, and you, and you, and you, who sit here as citizens of your countries. And the tragedy of the United Nations, if you want to project some of the problems that people now uh, feel the multilateral process and multilateralism have is, that the price for not reforming, for not evolving, I would even say, the United Nations in line with the times seems to be so low that it is a price worth paying. And the question is, I can understand some of the larger countries thinking along those lines because maybe running the world as a club is a very attractive prospect. But most of the world does not belong to that club, neither in people numbers nor in country numbers. And for that reason, I very much believe in working for the United Nations because I think it is the foundation of being able to have a world community coexist with one another, with nine billion people and everything getting scarcer, more difficult and complicated, to have a place where we negotiate fair solutions. And let's go back to Copenhagen. 
Oh, people blame everything from the Secretary General to Ivo de Boer to, you know, the United States or whoever for having failed in Copenhagen or the Danish presidency. And the truth is a very simple one. There was a deal to be had, but the deal wasn't good enough for a very simple reason. It wasn't fair enough. Now, you can always go now into discussing who didn't bring what to the table, and that could be a very long conversation. But it wasn't as if the United Nations hadn't done its job. It was the United Nations that became the platform for the convention, and even before that, the IPCC became the foundation upon which nations beyond the control of national interests were able to put the science on the table. And forgive me if I have to repeat here yet again that this onslaught on the science of climate change says more about those who assaulted than it says about any weaknesses that have been identified and discovered in the science of climate change. And that is something that again was possible because of an intergovernmental panel on climate change. And I think what the United Nations has done time and again is try to help the international community understand the threat, the opportunities, the necessity to act collectively. But if people are not willing to come to the table with a fair deal, then there is no deal. And I think we need to go back to that kind of analysis and ask ourselves, where does the reform and the evolution of the United Nations lie? And I think it will come at the moment when the majority of the world's nations realize that their interests are not best served if a club runs their collective agenda. And I think we are coming close to that. And at that moment, you will see also reform and not the kind of dilly-dallying we have seen for 10, 15 years right now on very parochial agendas. Hakim, uh, we're so glad that, that your leadership is uh, at UNEP and in the United Nations for all your last remarks. We probably have time for two final questions, actually, given the time. So one here and one over there. Thank you. My name is Hong Iko, a PhD student at SAIS. I have one question to Ms. Gordon. Uh, Shell gas is uh, relatively clean, and some countries like uh, U.S. Poland has big have big potential of production, and now in the U.S., shale gas is uh, commercially produced. And uh, do you think that the devel uh, shale gas development uh, discourage R&D of renewable energy? Uh, that's a, a great point, and uh, I, I think that shale gas and natural gas in general really are another big emerging issue in the United States. We are discovering huge new reserves there. I was saying earlier to some of the panelists that I have been at many events lately where that's been presented as the solution to all of the problems that we just brought up here. Um, I, there's a couple of problems with that. I mean, one, we're getting more and more and more information about the environmental impacts of, of shale gas uh, extraction. We're, we don't at the moment have a good regulatory regime uh, we need to develop that. Uh, so that's critically important. The other thing is that I think we've all underscored the concerns in general with relying on one technology. I mean, right now people think that shell gas is the answer, but that's because it happens to be cheap right now. Um, there are competing uses. Our chemical industry is quite worried about shale gas uh, because it, it, uh, using it for electricity raises the price for, uh, for it as a raw material. There's obviously environmental concerns and, and just concerns about the lack of diversification. I do think that there is potential in the next couple of years that the emergence of shale gas as a major sector will discourage diversification into other technologies in the United States. But um, I also think that the, um, the, the understanding about its environmental impacts, the need to impose regulatory regimes that will slow down the production and put a little bit of a cost on it. and. Um, the overall kind of consensus that I think we're getting to that we don't want to be completely reliant on one thing are all good. So in the long term, uh, I do think that we'll move beyond this moment. It's sort of like the ethanol moment. You know, it was the answer to all problems, and then it wasn't. <laughs> uh, I think we, we may be looking at a similar bridge fuel type of, uh, of, of moment here, but I, I think you're right in emphasizing its importance at this, at this time. Question right in front. Well, thank you very much. I'm Jed Schilling. I'm the chairman of the Millennium Institute, and we were one of the major contributors to this report for the agricultural chapter and the Threshold 21 model that was used to generate these scenarios going forward. And we've actually done models for, are doing models for a lot of other countries, looking at country-specific issues. 
China, United States, Mali, and a number of others. Um, and working on this report really highlighted to me a very important factor, which is that not only does shifting to the green economy produce better results than the business as usual or brown economy, but it was quite clear from the analysis that in many cases in the brown economy, the sustainability beyond 2050 was highly at risk, that it was likely that things like fish production, agricultural production, energy and other things would not be able to sustain improving livelihoods for 9 billion people on the earth. And it risked having a major economic downturn at that time. Not that we haven't had these in histories, like the salination problems with irrigation in Mesopotamia, deforestation in the Easter Islands and places like that. So I think in addition to the positive aspects of the shift, I think your reaction on this is also an important insurance policy to prevent a major, a major economic downturn that business as usual could lead to, despite all the things we hear from many of the uh, special interest groups that say, oh, no, we're fine. Everything's always going to be okay. They just assume natural resources will be there forever when, in fact, we're totally dependent on the environment, just, not just for pretty scenery, but for our basic livelihoods. And so we have to maintain and manage that or we could face very serious trouble. Thank you very much. I think um, just before we conclude, um, I'd like to thank very much uh, you, Akim, and, and to your staff in Washington, UNEP staff, who worked, I think, wonderfully collaboratively with, with both um, uh, Anne Angston and Andrea Norris uh, to make this happen. Uh, a lot of hard work behind the scenes. And thank you to the UN Foundation and to uh, the Center for American Progress uh, for a wonderful, lively session, which we hope will resonate and be influential uh, as we uh, take steps once we leave this room. So thank you. One more round of applause for a great panel. <laughs>